Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. And thank you, um, Bonnie, as well, for that um, wonderful um, sharing of your family's experience. It was really powerful to hear, so thank you. And I think it will speak to some of the things that I'm going to talk about today um, as well. So what I want to uh, give you an overview of, your, overview of is what we already know about how families communicate around the diagnosis and what their experiences are of that communication process. Um, as well as talking about some helpful tips that I've found through research but also from our experience of working with families. Um, and then I want to introduce you to some of the research that I'm embarking on um, because I find this, this area uh, to be of importance and of interest. Um, I've embarked on a, on a PhD project looking at how we can better support families in this context. So just to give you some background to me, I'm a registered specialist EDS genetic counsellor in Sheffield with about 10 years experience of working clinically. My background is both scientific, so from a genetics perspective, but also uh, in education and working with children and young people. So I'm interested in supporting families and supporting children. Um, and I have Jared to blame for me embarking on my PhD and taking seven years <laughs> to do so, which will finish in 2026, 2027, because um, he initially approached me about uh, resources um, to support families around family communication. And when I was researching the area, I realized that actually there's limited information out there and there's a gap uh, that needs to be filled. So what do we already know about family communication and people's experiences of family communication? And how do we know it? So we primarily know it from qualitative studies um, where families have been interviewed. So both parents and children have been interviewed about their experiences of learning about the diagnosis and sharing their, the diagnosis with uh, family members. Um, so most of it comes from things like focus groups and interview studies. Most of what we know about children's experiences actually comes from adults reflecting back on their experience as children. There are many studies which prospectively look at interviewing children after they've, they've heard the information, so there's a gap there as well. So as you know, genetics of course is a family affair and multiple times today uh, we've learned about how the diagnosis impacts family members and that might be from a medical perspective but also from an emotional and psychological perspective um, and practical perspective as well. We also know that genetic information can be really complex. Um, the understanding can be hard to grasp. Uh, I think people did a wonderful job of explaining really complex information on, in simple terms earlier but can be quite um, overwhelming sometimes when you're faced with the concept of sharing that information with family members. We also know that there is complexity in families and what family means. Um, so different families will have very different approaches um, and make very different decisions depending on their families and their own experiences. And it's really important to know that there's no right or wrong uh, way to go about this. The other thing that we know is that communication is often a process. Um, so people often don't sit down and have very heavy detailed conversations in one go. In fact, it tends to be something that's drip fed or information that's given gradually over time. And I'll talk a bit more about this later, but that gradual process is something that is preferred by all parties who have been researched. So what do you know about the benefits of communicating uh, with family members? So this is primarily in the context of parents talking to children, um, but this is also uh, important just in, in general communication. The principles remain the same. So the benefits um, range from families describing that they had a, set, a greater sense of cohesion, feeling closer together, feeling that they were part of uh, what had previously been um, perhaps a secret in the family, they felt they were part of that group. It can lead to additional support for children, so the children can access the support that they need in terms of their psychological well-being potentially, both from family members, because children can then feel they're able to ask questions and get support from family, but maybe from peer groups as well and external support. It gives an insight and helps children understand why parents might be anxious or upset um, and understand that it's not their fault, so there's no sense of blame. It's nothing that they've done. It helps them to get an insight into what's been going on in the family. It helps them to feel valued and included um, by knowing the secrets and knowing that nothing is being kept for them and develops that sense of trust. Sharing accurate information also helps to pr promote their coping strategies um, and helps them kind of build that sense of resilience. 
It also reduces the chance that they're going to seek information from other unreliable sources or that they may hear the information accidentally from another family member or overhear uh, parents communicating about the diagnosis. Of course, it, it's a difficult um, thing to embark on and um, throughout um, this, uh, this day and the sessions that we've had, some very difficult emotions can be raised and um, I jotted down a, a few things that have been talked about as we've gone through the day, but topics such as grief, shock, challenging emotions, feeling exhausted, alarmed, afraid, confused and fearful, all of these emotions can come up um, when we're thinking about communicating a diagnosis. So it's not to minimise that that can be a really hard thing to do. So the other thing is that it will bring back lots of things that perhaps you've experienced and they may remind you of things that you, you don't want to be reminded of and at times that maybe you don't want to talk about things. Um, so again, it, it comes back to the kind of looking after yourself and looking after that, your mental well-being um, and thinking about how to go about communicating that looks after yourself as well. People also worry that hearing the information uh, may affect their children's schoolwork um, or may affect their relationships with other children, um, but usually this impact is, is short term um, and uh, has less of an impact than having secrets kept in the family. So what do we know about what can happen if communication is closed? Um, so we know from the studies that have been done that by the age of eight, children know whether they can come to their parents and ask questions about a specific topic. So if they know that it's not appropriate in the culture of their family, they may not go on to ask questions. They may worry about things um, alone or they may access sources of information that aren't reliable. And not having access to that information can lead to confusion and sense of isolation. Um, and one thing that they talk about in the literature is something called magical thinking where children may have bits of information but not be able to understand the full picture and so they fill in the gaps themselves and that can often lead to them creating stories that are much more uh, difficult or challenging than perhaps the reality um, is. We talked about trust, so sometimes there can be the sense of betrayal, particularly if there's accidental disclosure um, and we do see that in our practice where family members have been told about a diagnosis from somebody separately or they've overheard it um, and that can be a very difficult um, thing to kind of uh, experience. They're also unsure if they can talk about the diagnosis at all so if it's something that's, that feels like a taboo or a stigma in the family children may not be, feel they're able to talk about it with anybody um, and they may have the sense of feeling silenced and, and not know where or, or how to go about talking. And of course, if they don't have accurate medical information, they may miss out on health decision making and reproductive decision making when they're planning a family in the future. So what do parents think about communicating with their children? Um, overwhelmingly, parents want to protect their children. They want their best for their children, of course. Um, and often, um, going for genetic testing um, is something that parents do because of their children. That's often the motivation to have a genetic test. And they believe that it is good to talk and share information and that they should be the ones communicating <coughs> rather than somebody that's perhaps not as close to the child or even a healthcare professional. Um, so again, there is this strong desire to protect. So often families feel this conflict between feeling that it's good to have knowledge and knowledge is power and to share that information but also wanting to protect their children from difficult and um, emotionally powerful um, information as well. So they, they sometimes feel a bit stuck in the middle as, as what is the best thing um, for my children. And parents often perceive that children will have a very strong negative reaction to the news. Um, and they may um, withdraw or delay giving information because they worry about that fear that, that the information may evoke in their children. The other thing that we know is it's mostly mothers or women that take the lead in communication. Not always, but some of the literature describes women as gatekeepers of genetic information um, and they tend to kind of manage the information in the family a bit more than, than men and their partners do. And really importantly, I think as a lot of the research has um, shown today, 
is people want support in how to go about doing this. And that can be formal support in the form of genetic counsellors or counsellors, uh, but that could be informally as well, so from other members of the AC community, other friends, other family members. And it was this uh, section of the research really uh, where people were saying, we've not got enough help in doing this that made me embark on this PhD. So we've learned about parents' experiences, but what do children think? So what do children say when they're interviewed about learning um, about genetic risk information? So they want information, and they often describe um, experiences where they haven't had enough information, and they want more information than what's been given to them. And they also want parents to tell them. So here are some quotes. I think this is more helpful than me describing what they say. Um, you can actually hear it um, in their own words. So knowing what's going on medically with my body is better than not. I want to learn more. I might be a bit angry if they didn't tell me because I want to just know. So I don't think there is anything to hide really when you've got a disease really. So no, I don't think there should be any secrets. And well, I, I feel like they didn't explain it enough. I mean, they didn't make me feel scared, but they didn't explain it enough for me to fully grasp. The other thing that children want is open and honest information. So they don't want information to be withheld or hidden from them, um, but they also want information delivered in the way that they won't become overwhelmed or, sc or too scared about the information. Um, and this again is a quote from a child that was interviewed, just said, you can't sugarcoat it. You have to tell them exactly what it is. If you tell them everything's 100% perfect and you just, it just about won't affect them, it's not true. I'd rather know the full truth. And we'll talk about strategies to help reduce the kind of fear and the way that things are communicated a bit later. The other thing overwhelmingly in the literature, and I think has come across today as well, is how resilient children are. And Bonnie talked about Mia being very brave, um, and I think it, it was really powerful to read some of the accounts as to how well children adapt and cope with information. And again, this is a quote from a child. Uh, it's worth it to know so that you can have screening done. Making it so you can take better care of yourself is just something else to know about your body, you know, about your history, so you can take care of yourself in the best possible way. And again, this come, that speaks again to this knowledge is power idea that we've heard um, throughout um, today. And again, they want gradual information over time. They don't want people to sit down with them and have a very serious, long conversation. They want information to be drip-fed from a young age so that they've got time to adapt to it, integrate it into their identity, but not let it overwhelm their whole being. So it's just a, a, a part of them. It's one of their stories not their entirety of them, they're multi-story, there's a lot going on with children, and this is just one aspect of them. Um, and again, we learned about that with, with Nia and her love of dogs and all the activities that she loves to do. Gradually integrating information about the genetic condition makes it that small part of their identity rather than feeling overwhelming. And in the context, particularly when we're talking about cardiac conditions and vascular EDS, it also helps children to adjust um, and develop their interests in activities that are safer uh, for children with vascular EDS rather than at the age of 16 perhaps having to adjust and change um, all the activities that they're doing. So this is a quote from an adult who has an inherited cardiac condition that says, well let's say you get a child who has this and you grow up, it becomes a part of your life from the day you're born. Then you get a completely different perspective than others like me who got the message so brutally have a very different opportunity to adjust and make something positive out of it. So I talked a little bit about this gradual information giving um, and there's also uh, uh, some research that's looked into well what information can you give at what point and how should it be um, delivered um, and one meta-synthesis which looked at pulling together lots of the interviews with parents and children looked at what children understand at different age ranges about genetic information and also how they responded emotionally and psychologically to that information. So up to the age of seven years old, um, children understand the information in terms of what they can see in front of them, so what are the visible differences that they can see. 
Some of them had an understanding of biological relationship, and that understanding of mum and dad and other family members. Um, and their emotional responses tend to be on a superficial level. So often parents describe feeling very anxious about talking to their children. And then once we've spoken to them afterwards, they often say, well, actually, I gave them a bit of information. They asked me a few questions, and then they just got on with playing what they were playing with before. And it wasn't a big deal. Um, so often, again, it's that what's in front of them uh, affects their, their kind of emotional well-being. So on a superficial level. As we get a bit older, between the ages of 8 and 11, it's a similar kind of emotional response. Um, most of the children look for positives and it doesn't become a central focus. So again, they go on to go and to get on with their day and, and their daily activities. Again, they understood it in terms of what they can see um, and they also had more of a sense of how something might be passed down in a family. Not the, the details of the portraying was on dominant inheritance or the 50-50 chance, but just this sense of uh, inheritance in general. So again, this is a quote from a, um, an eight-year-old, born with it, something to do with my DNA when I was being made. So that's the level of kind of understanding at that point. And then a parent describes their reaction uh, the child's reaction to information about a, diagnos a diagnosis of Huntington's disease in this context. And they say it wasn't all boo-hoo mummy's poorly, it was a relief because she understands why mummy was that way she, and why she'd been treating her the way that she did. So although I'm, I'm giving information from lots of different conditions, overwhelmingly the principles are the same um, with multiple different genetic conditions. So as we get a bit older, obviously children have a better understanding of biology and of genetics and they learn about it in school. They have a greater understanding of the future and mortality. Um, they may again not understand the nitty gritty details of the genetics, um, but they have got more of a sense of the family structure and how things may affect family members. At this point in children's life, if they're diagnosed with a condition, it may be a period of rebellion and asking questions such as why me? this isn't fair. So sometimes children just need a little bit of um, more emotional support or psychological support. Um, but again, it wasn't uh, an overwhelmingly negative uh, reaction. In fact, it was quite the opposite. So as we get into 15 to 17 year olds, they have a much greater understanding. A lot of them could understand the inheritance um, and implications for children and potentially their future children. Um, and earlier on, um, one of the talks we talked about preconception counselling and when that should start. Um, and at the ages of 15 to 17, children can start to take in that information about what does this mean for my future offspring. Again, children took away the positives, but at this point they did experience more feelings of upset and shock than some of the other age range. Um, but overwhelmingly, for all of these age ranges, the summary of the literature was that at no point did the children let this information monopolise their lives and they were able to take multiple positives from the information. So I explain that most of the literature that, that's been produced looks at lots of different genetic conditions and I tried to pull out some conditions with similar overlap to vascular EDS just to summarise what children and young people think. Um, and what the studies have shown, so the top one says that adolescents actually were really glad to hear about their genetic test results. So although lots of tricky emotions came up, overall they were glad to have the information. The psychological responses um, to individuals were better if they were given information at a younger age. Sometimes it can be harder to integrate the information in adolescence. Young participants were pragmatic about the results in these studies. And one thing that did come out is that parents often fear sharing this information and in one, studies, they rate, one study, they rated the psychological well-being of their child as significantly lower than um, their children actually rated the psychological well-being. Um, and again, as I summarised before, the condition did not monopolise the lives of children. So what we know is that people want to talk, and most people do not actively resist passing on information, but they do face multiple issues in working out who needs to know, what to tell them, when and where. So here are some tips that we've uh, discovered over the years. Again, you're the expert. Not only are you are experts or are becoming experts in the condition, but you're also experts in your own lives and your family's lives and your children. So there is nobody that's going to be able to tell you better than yourselves how the best way to go about communicating is. 
but I can share some tips that people have shared with us over the years. And again, your mental well-being is really important, so look after yourself um, before sharing information. Um, again, if you've just had the diagnosis, you've just had the information, a lot of those feelings of grief and fear and confusion um, may feel like they are the main emotions in your life at that point, and that's completely normal, and it's okay to feel those feelings. And it's also okay to spend some time looking after yourself. If you've not had a chance to adapt to this information, then you're not going to be able to communicate that information to your children. And they'll pick up on some of that anxiety and may feel that they can't ask questions because they also want to protect you and they don't want to ask questions that may upset you. So look after yourself and reach out for support. Um, they're supported multiple um, uh, areas, so maybe in terms of the genetics, you want to speak to a genetic counsellor, it may be in terms of talking to other families, you know, what worked for them, what didn't work for them. Um, and it may be more formalised support as well for your mental well-being. And then make a plan, make a plan of action. Um, I'm just going to skip through a little bit um, because I'm running out of time. Um, but with a plan, think about the, the ins and outs, so where, um, what timing, what's the content, who's going to be present, who's going to be absent. Consider how you've done it in the past. So parents will often have to have difficult conversations with their children and you may be able to pick on those experiences to help you with this conversation. Consider role playing it. We've done that as genetic counsellors with families before. You may want to do it with friends and family. And children also describe preferring to have information in an informal setting. So when they're driving, playing, um, cooking, um, and not in kind of a really formal sit down. So this quote just describes um, a child saying that she happens to be getting up early at the same time as her mum um, and it was normal for them to just sit on the sofa and have a chat and so it was coming up gently over time during those, period, those early morning conversations. I'm not going to play that um, video but essentially one of the things that I'm interested in is, is what words people use when they're communicating. Um, and I'd be interested to learn kind of what worked for you if you've experienced this. Were there any particular words that were helpful or that you found difficult? Um, essentially, the words aren't necessarily too important. Um, it's more about the overall sense of the communication. But it, it's interesting to learn and can, sometimes can be helpful to have information from how other families did it. Now, we talked about open and honest disclosure. Um, open and honest doesn't mean that you have to give all the information at once. It should be dictated by your child and their needs. Um, and that will change over time and it will gradually um, progress. Um, and it will help them to know that they can come back to you and ask questions as their needs evolve and change. Um, also, explain to them that there are lots of different sources of information and they're not all accurate. And if they read something and they're worried, they can come to you to ask those questions. Um, so it's that open, safe space that is created. So create a safe space. Create an environment where they can ask questions. And maybe give yourself some time to prepare for some of those questions. And again, you don't have to give all the information at once. Ad adapt and tailor it uh, to your, your child's needs. And allow them space to have an emotional reaction. We talked about some of those tricky emotions that come up. And they may have some difficult emotions. Acknowledge that it's normal to have those emotions and that they can talk to you about those emotions and then they're more likely to come to you in the future. Follow up with them, check in with them after the conversation. Again, that comes back to that creating of a safe space and give them permission to always come back and ask. Let them be in charge. Let them be the boss, just as near as the boss. Let them be the people that direct you. So if you've given them a bit of information and you've made it safe for them, they'll want to come back uh, and lead um, lead how the conversation progresses. And so overwhelmingly from everything that I have read, um, people integrate this information into their lives and it doesn't dominate. So this family talks about the fact that we've never allowed the issue of genetic testing to dominate our lives. When it was going on we talked about it, but after that everybody picked up the thread. Last month we had a family weekend and it wasn't discussed at all. So just because you give information it doesn't mean that that's going to be a topic um, always, and that's going to overwhelm the family, actually quite the opposite. I'm running out of time a little bit, so I'm going to whiz through the information about my PhD project, but I am around if people have got questions. 
Um, essentially what I'm wanting to do is to co-produce with the help of the uh, patient and uh, information group, involvement group and with participants potentially to the study, an online tool um, that will help people to have these conversations, so an actual structured approach to help have helpful conversations with family members. And it's based on something called the Tree of Life, um, and it's a narrative approach, so it again comes back to helping people to tell their stories, um, so they feel like there's lots of aspects to their being, um, and that they can have helpful conversations um, around the diagnosis. They may feel more comfortable sharing their experiences, um, develop positive views of themselves to increase their self-esteem, position and confirm themselves as experts. Keep coming back to this, you're experts um, in so many aspects of this. How can we really emphasize that in a tool that can be developed? And change the relationship with vascular EDS so perhaps it impacts less, negative on, ne less negatively on lives. So this is quite a busy slide, I'm not gonna go through all the details, but um, on the left, Left hand side, right hand side, um, is a picture of the tree of life as an example of something that we work through during the sessions that gives people tools to talk and vocabulary to talk um, about their experiences. And so some of these uh, groups have been um, evaluated in other contexts, um, and this is some of the feedback from a, a group in Manchester. Um, that says, I mean, it's a means to talk, it's a key to use in a lock to express my thoughts and feelings without too much emotion slowing me down. Um, so it's a way to express and explore some of these tricky emotions without, again, becoming overwhelming. So in summary, people want to talk, parents and children want to talk, but often it can be difficult to know who to talk to, how, what and when. And there are resources available to support you with that. Importantly, though, you are the experts. Um, and you're the experts in so many ways. Um, and we're learning so much from you um, throughout our journeys as well. It's often scarier uh, than you may first think. And often parents feel relieved when they share the information because they're not keeping that secret anymore. Look after yourself. Create a safe space for both yourself and for your children when you're um, going through this. Um, make a plan and ask for help if, at any point if you need it. Um, and genetic counsellors will be very happy to be a sounding board or role play anything with you to help you through this process. And I will provide you with more information about the pre-HD project later in the year and we'll start uh, recruiting later in this year as well. Okay, thank you very much.